I want to thank you all for being here. And um, let us ask for God's blessing on our study of his word today. Lord God, our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for leaving us your love, love, love letter in the Bible and reminding us of your law and your gospel. Please now give us the Holy Spirit's power to learn as much as we can from your word, to learn from each other, and then also to be able to take what we learn and incorporate it into our lives day by day as your followers. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, I got just a couple pictures I want to share with you this morning to test to make sure you can see everything. Uh, there's one that uh, uh, was on one church sign. I want to thank Jim uh, Vailing who shared these with me uh, this last week, and I've gotten them over the years, but this was a fresh collection, so I thought I'd share a couple with you this morning. Here's another one from the First Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Do not criticize your wife's judgments. See whom she married. <laughs> and then there was one by the Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church. Too hot to keep changing sign. Sin bad. Jesus good. Details inside. <laughs> that was pretty good. And then the Christian church in Panama City. God shows no favoritism, but our sign guy does. Go Cubs. <laughs> I imagine if we had a sign, uh, we'd have to say go Broncos and go Vikings because Pastor uh, Larson really likes the Broncos. Okay, and here's the last one. <laughs> what is hell like come here our preacher <laughs> you just wonder who is in charge of putting these signs up uh, i don't think it's the pastor maybe he's I got a great, great sense, sense of humor so i want to thank jim bailing for those okay um i'm going to get rid of the video panel so it's not bothering you there we go. Then I'm going to hide the patrol there. Now you should be able to see the screen pretty uh, clearly. And I made the print a little bit larger. Uh, we'll be reading through the text that you have um, on the collection uh, on the table if you don't have one. Um, or pick up a Bible and then you can check the translation here following with what we've got printed out here. What I printed out is the ESV translation. I like it because it stays pretty close to the original languages. And so it um, gives you a good hint as to what is in the text. Some translations try to make it so understandable in English that you don't have a hint as to what the Hebrew or the Greek is that's behind the word. But the ESV stays pretty close. So we didn't quite get a chance to answer all the questions that people had about last week's lesson on King Saul consulting a medium in Endor uh, because he was facing an onslaught from the Philistine army. Um, and I thought we'd just quickly review uh, what we can say about the appearance of Samuel to him there in Endor. Um, I've got three possibilities that I've heard people give. One, that it was a demon impersonating Samuel because mediums work with the power of Satan and with the power of demons, and that's the only real good explanation. Uh, and the problem with that uh, explanation uh, is that it also raises the question, well, then how did she get it right? Because uh, everything that um, Samuel predicts happens the next day. Saul and his three sons are all killed and uh, the army of Israel is defeated by the Philistines. So uh, that's one possibility and, and some of the problems with it. Um, a second possibility is that she was a ventriloquist and because the text doesn't say that Samuel uh, was seen directly by uh, Saul, that she was representing him by changing her voice and making herself sound like him and channeling his voice through her to uh, Saul. Um, and um, there were apparently some mediums who have done that, who have functioned like a ventriloquist and 
could make themselves sound like the person who they supposedly were, were pulling up. Um, and again, you have the same problem with that, and that is how does she know the details of what was gonna happen the next day? You know, a third possibility is that we take the text as it stands. And uh, that uh, is my particular preference um, because uh, somehow the spirit of Samuel appears to King Saul. It doesn't say that she successfully brought up that spirit. She's shocked. She shrieks when she sees it. And I think it was as big a surprise for her as it was for anyone. And so uh, I, I, I'm inclined to infer from that, that this was Samuel, that God did an exception, even though he denounced necromancers and uh, seeking to hear the voices of the dead. Uh, in this case, he pulls up Samuel as an act of judgment on King Saul. And he then, uh, by that activity, reinforces what Samuel has already said while he was alive when he denounced King Saul and said, the Lord has torn away your kingdom from you. He's got a better man to replace you. And that was the judgment that King Saul was under. And it isn't relieved in anything that Samuel says to him. Had this been a demon posing to be Samuel, I would have thought that the text would have said that because it says that clearly throughout the whole New Testament. When there are demons that are possessing people that are speaking through someone, um, it doesn't say that Georgie was uh, speaking. It says a demon uh, was speaking through him, or sometimes they're, they're called by different uh, quantities. You know, my name is Legion, for we are many, uh, says one demon to Jesus. So uh, that's my inclination. It's not inspired. And uh, you may think of another opportunity. Uh, explanation. Um, but I think what this says to me is God is a God who is sovereign. And when God decides to do something, even though he suspends his prohibitions and his commandments and his rules, God can do that. He does that sometimes with his miracles. We know the law of gravity says things have got to fall. Okay. That goes up, goes down. But Jesus defied the law of gravity and ascended into heaven. And so um, th there are times when God is sovereign and he displays that. And so I'm comfortable with that. Now, Jim, have you heard any other uh, uh, explanations? Or, uh, so, um, and that's not original with me. Pastor um, Larson said that he took that position. He was the only student in the seminary class who took that position when everybody was assigned to explain who's, who was speaking, whether it was a demon or Samuel, and everybody else that was a demon. You know? But, and I, I used to say that way back, but the more I studied it and the more I thought about it and the more I've read my scriptures, the more I realized that um, we're trying to put God in a box when we do that and say, well, God would never do this. Well, we don't know that. <laughs> we can't look into the mind of God. And so uh, we go by the base of the text and the text says, Samuel said to him, Samuel said to him. And so, that settles it for me. You know. Now, do you have any questions about that? Because you will hear others. I listened to over a dozen videos, presentations of this chapter, just to hear what other people are saying. And from time to time, I learn a new, a new insight, uh, but you will hear the whole range of explanations. So just wanted to give you my thinking on that. Any others, that questions that you have? So uh, question three. Where is the law in this episode? <laughs> I, I think it's all the way through it. Um, the challenge is where is the gospel? And my sister-in-law who watched the videotape of the class from last week uh, sent me an email and said, where was the gospel in that? <laughs> and, and I think it raised a really good question that we can um, address when talking about episodes, especially like today's episode, which is horrific uh, in its details. Uh, where is the gospel? Uh, sometimes I believe the gospel is implied in the denunciations of the law. It's opening the door to people to say, whoa, I have really made a big mistake because they're getting law, law, law. And that's what Saul was getting. I mean, he was facing 
imminent destruction the next day from the Philistines. Samuel reinforces what he had already told him, that you've lost the kingdom, it's not yours. But there's still a chance that after hearing Samuel and his spirit speak to him, he could have gotten on his knees and said, God, I have been a terrible sinner. I have made a terrible mistake. But I know that you're a God of unbelievable grace and mercy. Please forgive me. Even if I have to die tomorrow, please forgive me. We don't have any evidence he did that. But the implied invitation was there. And I think what that teaches me is when I read the confrontation that Jesus has with the Pharisees in the New Testament, and he has a lot of them, you don't hear him saying, well, friend, if you'll only give your heart to me, then you can have forgiveness and have eternal life. Well, turn your life over to God. No, but he denounces them and he condemns what they're doing, which is a way of God coming to a person and saying, I'm going to preach stern law to you so you realize that you're a sinner and you don't have any hope on the base of your performance to be acceptable to God. So you need me. You need what I'm doing for you. And even though he doesn't say it, it's implied in, in those presentations. God is giving those Pharisees, those enemies of God, and here he's giving Saul one last opportunity to receive salvation, even if his life is not going to be saved, even if his kingdom is not going to be saved, even if his uh, life of his sons is not going to be saved the next day. So um, I think we can look for that when we have episodes that are just wrecked through and through with condemnation, bad news, and law, okay? And we'll have to look for that today in today's story. Any questions about that? Does that sound like I'm kind of running fast and loose with the law and gospel? I hope not. Uh, I think it's a subtlety that we see in the ministry of Jesus, especially, that sometimes he is reaching out even to the people who he is condemning in order to pull the rug out from under their self-righteousness and to leave them flat on the floor and realizing that I don't have a chance. What, what, what hope do I have? And their hope is standing right in front of them, you know. And so uh, that's something for us to look for sometimes in these uh, law-laden stories and episodes. Okay, um, so that's where I think the gospel is. It's more implied than it's stated. And how does life, Saul's life end? Well, the next day we're told that they shoot him full of arrows. They kill his three sons. And he asks his armor bearer to take his life so he is not going to be abused by the Philistines if they capture him alive. Um, and his armor bearer refuses because Saul is still his boss, his master, his the anointed of God as far as he's concerned. And so he doesn't do it. And Saul falls on his own sword and dies. And then the armor bearer copies him and does the same thing. In the last two chapters, you have other variations of that story where um, a, in, when David hears about it, it's from a guy who's all beaten up and he comes back and reports that he found Saul uh, about to die and Saul asks him to kill him. And so he does. And he brings the bracelet and the crown of King Saul to David thinking that he's going to get a merit badge uh, from David for doing that. And David kills him, executes him for having killed the anointed of God. And can you reconcile that story with the story we hear in 1 Samuel 28, 29? Um, here's my way. I try. I'd like to reconcile things and bring harmony to the, the scriptures that seem at first blush to be contradicting one another. If it's true that Saul fell on his sword, and the scriptures here summarize it by saying, and he died, that doesn't mean that maybe he's still lingering when this other guy comes along that's not his armor bearer. And Saul says, do, do, do me in. This is terrible. And that's when the guy does it. So it may sound like a stretch, but I think it's a possibility. And we know that when we read the scriptures uh, throughout, uh, sometimes they just summarize things in one text, and then they give us more detail in a different text about that very same incident. So 
uh, you may run into that tension as you read the whole three chapters uh, as a suite. Um, but you can decide what you do there. Any concluding questions on Saul and the medium of Endor? Then let's move on. Um, this story takes place before the time of King Saul in the time of the judges. And um, here's an outline of the book of the judges, which takes a judge who is raised up by God, not as a, a judiciary judge in a courtroom. He's instead a charismatic leader, a warrior, um, a hero, a rescuer. And all through the period of the judges, you will hear the same thing. The people of God commit idolatry. The people of God are unfaithful. So God allows an oppressor to oppress them, to discipline them. They realize that they have sinned and they turn to God and God raises up for them a champion. And you have Othniel and you have Ehud and Shamgar and Deborah and Gideon, all in th that order that are re reported on in the book of Judges. Then you get Tola and Jair, some more minor ones, Jephthah, Ibsan, Elan, and Abdon. And you end up with Samson, the great stories of Samson. Now, every one of these judges that we have stories about, some we don't have a whole lot of stories, just summary of their judgeship. All of them are flawed human beings, seriously flawed. And Samson is chief among them. You know, and, and, and it seems as you work your way through the book of Judges, you get more and more intense depravity. It's just heaping up one example after another about how depraved Israelites have become. They have completely disconnected themselves from the word of God, and they make up their minds about what they're going to do based on their feelings, based on their culture, based on what people around them are doing. And that's why it summarizes their approach in the very last book of the uh, last passage of the book. Each man, there was no king in Israel. Each man did what was right in his own eyes. Now, does that sound contemporary? <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a commentary on our culture? Everybody is saying, I think we should do this. I think this is right. And they're calling things that the Bible calls wrong, right? They're calling God, things that God says are sins, okay, and as a free choice. And this was the case in the period of the judges. And then the book ends with these two episodes about Levites. One was Micaiah and a Levite, which we're not going to talk about in any detail, um, but they are committing idolatry. And uh, you'd say, wait a minute, a Levite is supposed to be a functionary in the temple. He's supposed to be assisting the priests. He's supposed to be a descendant of Levi, and he's supposed to be serving God. Well, how come a, a Levite would condescend to that and go along with that? That is the whole point of the, the story. And this story that we're going to be looking at is a glaring example that not only were the common people deciding what was right and wrong by what was in right in their own eyes, so do all the Israelites in this story, all of the Israelites and the Levite especially. And so what it tells us is that religious people aren't exempt from idolatry, from unfaithfulness from sin, from desecrating the holiness of God, and people who function even in religion officially as priests and Levites can also do that. So there's, a, a, well, you're going to see this as we, let's read through the text. So let's ask for God's blessing. Lord God, Heavenly Father, this is a disturbing text. And, um, Thank you that we're all adults, because this is not a story that I would necessarily share with young kids and my grandkids. Yeah, not yet. And, uh, but it's in your word, and there's something for us to learn. So help us to see what you want us to know, and then help us as we grapple with this text to learn from each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we begin in chapter 19, verse 1. In those days... When there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, 
who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah. So you've got two terms that I think need a little fleshing out, and that is Levite and concubine. So what's a Levite? In Numbers, it tells us the responsibilities of Levites. It counts them and tells us how they function. They had to be 25 to 50 years old to serve as a Levite in the tabernacle or in the temple. They are to own no land like all the other tribes were given regions of the promised land. The Levites weren't. However, they were to assist the priests at the tabernacle. And in response for their service, even though they didn't have any land themselves, um, Israel was to give one-tenth of their income for the support of the Levites and the priests. And there were three groups of Levites from the three families of Levi, Gershon, Merari, and Kohath. And each of them, during the time of the tabernacle, remember that was the movable tent, place of worship, that was the house of God. Uh, each of them had a responsibility because you remember that during the time of the tabernacle in the wilderness, during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness on the way to the promised land under Moses, the people uh, would stay settled and camped until a pillar of cloud that was right over the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle would get up and move. At night, it was a pillar of fire. But when that pillar got up and moved, that was a signal everybody was to break camp, pack up, and let's follow. And they would go to their next camp place. And no Israelite was allowed to see what was inside the tabernacle. Only the priest got to go inside the holy place and see the seven branch candlestick, the golden altar in front, and where they burned incense, and the table of showbread where they had 12 loaves of unleavened bread that were replaced every week. And the priests would eat the leftover bread that was replaced, and they would put out 12 new loaves. So the average Israelite, you and I, would never have seen what the menorah looked like, what the golden altar looked like, what the table of showbread looked like, because it was very strictly commanded by God that they were to go in when it was time to move, and the priests would wrap all of these instruments in cloths, blue cloth, and then covered it with seal skin or some other kind of skin to make it waterproof. And then the Levites would come in after everything was covered and they would take it out and each of them had different responsibilities. One family had the responsibility for carrying all the curtains that were around the courtyard and all the poles that were holding them. Another family was responsible for carrying all of the construction pieces of the tabernacle itself, the coverings that it had, five coverings of skins to make it waterproof. Uh, it had planks that were all around it that had to be dismantled and carried. And some of the teams of Levites were allowed to have wagons with oxen to help carry this. But one family, Kohath, were responsible for carrying the articles inside the sanctuary, including the Ark of the Covenant, which was never seen by the Israelites according to God's command. Now, I think that changed through the history of Israel. I think they got careless, and I think they did bring it out. I think they did let it get seen. Um, and the Philistines steal it one day. And so I don't think the Philistines cared about covering it up and listening to what God had to say. But the family of Kohath were responsible after the priests who were alone allowed to see the Ark of the Covenant, and only the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. And he, he would cover it completely. And then the, and probably get it out into the, or dismantle everything around it. And then uh, the Levites who were responsible would, they had two poles in it and they would carry it. They would not put it on a cart. They would not pull it with oxen. The Levites in that family had to carry it from place to place to place to place. Now, did Israel always follow those rules? I don't think so. And I think as you read through the history of Israel, you can see 
that the implications seem to be that they kind of forgot that. And even the priests forgot how strictly they were supposed to keep this a secret. And um, it wasn't preserved that way. So the Levites, when they landed in the promised land, um, were also given cities, 48 cities in which they could live. But they weren't given territory. And they were given a thousand feet or a thousand uh, cubits, 1500 feet um, in a perimeter around that city so they could keep a few animals for their own food and so forth. But generally their income came from the offerings of the Israelites for them. And therefore six of those 48 Levitical cities were identified as cities of refuge. And they were scattered throughout um, the 12 tribes of Israel so that if a person accidentally killed somebody and the family was looking for them to commit revenge killing, they could flee to the refuge city. And as long as they stayed in that refuge city, they are, their life was protected. But if they stepped outside the perimeter of that refuge city, then they were fair game and they could be killed uh, by the family. So, um, that was the job of the Levites. So they were not just functionaries in the tabernacle during uh, the time of the wilderness wandering and during this time of the judges when we still don't have a temple built. That doesn't come until Solomon builds it after David, after Saul. And so this is all pre-King Saul and in this story. And so you ask yourself, what were the responsibilities of the Levites when they were living in their cities? And the responsibility was to teach the word of God. And they were to represent the word of God. At people. And that's what makes this story so glaring, because this is a guy who is a guy who was supposed to teach the word of God and role model it and display it. And he does everything except that. And so um, in First Chronicles 15, 16, David orders Levites to provide music, 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 not music for the worship. And that comes you know, after the story that we're having today. But that, those are some of their functions, to serve in the worship life of Israel as well and play musical instruments. Uh, King Hezekiah sets up uh, an order of priests and Levites and their responsibilities, and they rotated. So they would come from their city where they were living, and they would stay encamped near the tabernacle or near the temple when the temple was built, and they would serve there for their week of responsibility two weeks a year, and they would follow that order of, of service that was set up by King David and later by King Hezekiah. And so that's what a Levite was supposed to do. Now, do you have any questions about Levites? So in order to be a priest, you had to be a Levite, but a priest also had to be a direct descendant of Aaron and his sons. And there are people today in Israel who claim to be Kohens. The word Kohen is Hebrew for priest. And they claim they can trace their ancestry back to Aaron. And for that reason, their children are eligible, their boys are eligible to become priests in the new temple that they hope to build. But that's the task of a, of a Levite, to be a representative of God wherever he lived and to instruct people. Um, and you need to know that when we look at what he does. A concubine is first recognized in the life of Abraham. Hagar was an Egyptian who they had brought back apparently from Egypt, from their stay in Egypt, and she was a concubine. And they did not have the same rights as a full wife, but, and there's no way where in scripture that God condones the role of the concubine, but. Um, he tolerates it and they have when they have children those children don't necessarily um, have the same inheritance as the children of the biological wife um, or the full wife and so if he's to be a role model why does this levite end up having a concubine you know what, what's going on here and what it shows us is that all through the different periods of Israeli history, Israelite history, um, the people and the religious leaders simply didn't follow what God had to say. So 
Let's read. And his concubine was unfaithful. Literally, the Hebrew reads, she was a harlot. So she must have gone outside of their relationship and done something sexually that was immoral. And then she went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. And she was there for four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. Hmm. Why did it take him four months? You know, um, was he steamed? Was he angry? Was he upset, feeling betrayed uh, that she had been immoral? Uh, we don't know. Uh, the, the text doesn't go into the soap opera details uh, often in, in Hebrew scripture. But uh, are there any other possible explanations why it's four months before he decides to go retrieve her? Do you, do you have any thoughts as to other possible explanations? If I were to interview you and you were the Levite who has this concubine and you have come yourself from the territory of Ephraim, that's up here, okay? Well, see, that's the complicated thing about the life, uh, arrangement of concubine. It's a good question. Why do they call him her husband? Because he functioned as her husband. And so we know that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I mean, you say, what's going on there? You know, I mean, he really fell away from God. I mean, because that would certainly not be justifiable. And so uh, in that culture, they the, apparently that kind of concubine itch, uh, that that kind of um, arrangement was also in the Canaanite environment that they were living in, and they pick up on that. Maybe it was already in Egypt too, and they picked up on it. Um, so uh, he was regarded as her husband. She did not get a dowry the way a legitimate wife did. So if he divorces her, which he can do, um, and separates her, she does not get guaranteed a dowry to take with her. Um, in Judaism today, if when they have a marriage, they have a document that promises the wife a ketubah, and that is a promised amount of money if her husband divorces her. So she's got something to survive on. And apparently a concubine from everything I could read did not have that guarantee. Okay. And she did not have inheritance rights. Only the legitimate wife did. It could be that he was busy. That's a good guess. Uh, that, that's certainly legitimate. That is harvest time. And, and so he, he didn't have time to go chasing after her. You know? uh, anybody else have another guess? Another possibility is that he had to go to the tabernacle and perform his duty, and that may have preoccupied him. And he, I can't take I, this is cut, you know, I imagine it was tearing his guts out uh, that this woman had committed adultery and, or, or unfaithfulness and then was gone. But uh, he had stuff to do that he couldn't uh, not do. Uh, other guests, you had a, a thought? Maybe. Okay. Okay, so that's a good guess that he waits four months to make, see if she's pregnant. Yeah. But that's still as, as good a guess as any. Uh, so that, that's a good possibility. But anyway, um, he is a man who's from this territory, Ephraim. Okay. And he has picked up this concubine from Bethlehem, which is in Judah. And then the, in between Ephraim and Judah is the territory of Benjamin. And Jerusalem is right on the borderline of Judah and Benjamin, but it's officially in Benjamin. And Saul, King Saul, will come from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, And so that's the location of what's happening. And this is where... The events will take place now in this story. Um, he comes from Ephraim, gets a concubine. The, the later in the story, he's going to meet the father, it sounds like, for the first time. And says, so how does he get this concubine uh, without knowing the dad, you know, uh, his father-in-law? 
And he actually called the man his father-in-law. And that gets back to Marnie's question. That is, what is, um, what's the deal? Why is he called a husband when uh, it's a weird arrangement? But um, that was part of it. So he had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys. And she brought him into her father's house when he finally arrived. And so she is receptive. Are there any hints that she was a battered wife in her response to him? Is it? Now, we haven't mentioned that as a possibility. Uh, she may have been unfaithful because he was a batterer, a uh, wife beater. And uh, we're not told that, in fact. I realize I'm speculating now. But the question is, when she goes with dad, instead of coming back to him, she apparently doesn't trust that he will forgive her. In fact, what is the penalty if you commit adultery in Old Testament? stoning that's right so she may have gone to dad because she knew pretty well that if this guy's esteemed uh, he could call upon the law to justify his stoning her and when the girl's father saw him he came with joy to meet him and is now meet him could mean uh meet him a uh, third or fourth time that he's seen him uh, or it could mean for the first time and his father-in-law the girl's father made him stay and he remained with him three days. So they ate and drank and spent the night there. Good hospitality in the ancient world. Um, you eat, you drink and you share conversation. And on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning and he prepared to go, but the girl's father said to his son-in-law, notice the terminology here makes it sound very much like a formal marriage. You know, he calls him a son-in-law, calls him a father-in-law, and that's in the Hebrew text as well. That's what the word is used. This isn't just an English um, uh, paraphrase of the term. Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that you may go. So the two of them sat and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, be pleased to spend the night and let your heart be merry. And so he hides now with them four days. Okay. And when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law pressed him again till he spent the night there again. And on the fifth day, he arose early in the morning to depart. Now it's time to get out of Dodge. And the girl's father said, strengthen your heart and wait until the day declines. So they ate both of them. And when the man and his concubine and his servant rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, behold, now the day has waned toward evening. Please spend the night. It's not really safe to travel at night in the ancient world. Behold, the day draws to its close. Lodge here and let your heart be merry. And tomorrow you shall arise early in the morning for your journey and go home. So why is the father so eager to keep this guy there? Maybe he says, that's a good guess. Maybe he's suspecting that his um, son-in-law is just getting her out of town so he can stone her to death, you know, in retribution for what she did to him. That's one possibility. Any other possibilities? What? That's a good guess, too, I think, that if there was any possibility that the Levite had been abusing her, the father wants to get a good lay of the land before he lets this guy take his daughter again. Okay. Um, any other guesses? Then, verse 10, but the man would not spend the night. He rose up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. Let's see if I got the map here. No, it's got to go back up here. Here we are. So he gets to, from Bethlehem to, they have Jerusalem on this map, but it wasn't called Jerusalem until the time of King David. So it was Jebus, and some of the texts um, call it Jerusalem, but um, it was Jebusites who occupied it. This was not a Jewish town. It was conquered by David, but uh, until that time, it was a Canaanite stronghold. And so his servant says, let's stay here overnight. It's close by, it's getting dark. And he says, no, I don't wanna stay with foreigners. I wanna move on to fellow Jews. So let's go up here and find a place to stay, maybe in the area of Benjamin. With, now this has Gabaon, which um, is next to Gibeah, where they finally land, okay? So 
That being said, let's get back to the text. Verse 11, when they were near Jebus, the day was nearly over, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to this city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of the foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. What was he afraid of? Abuse, <laughs> uh, probably, and, and not being treated very nicely. Um, irony of ironies, when he goes to his own people, that's when he really gets uh, attacked and abused, and so does his concubine. So he's assuming that the Gentile city is a lot less safe than a city of the Jews. And we're going to see that all of the depravity that is true of the Canaanites has now seeped into the life of the Israelites. Verse 13, and he said to his young man, come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. This will be the birthplace of Saul, and it'll also be his first capital when he becomes king. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, which is the normal place a traveler would sit and hope that somebody in the town would offer Middle Eastern hospitality. And hospitality was king among the virtues that people were supposed to have and so if you saw someone that didn't have a place to stay overnight then you would offer that to them what they didn't know is how dangerous the city square was and the city itself and the people that were living in it and behold an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening the man was also from the hill country of ephraim where the levite was from and he was sojourning in Sib Gibeah, so he had moved there himself, probably to find work. Uh, we don't know for sure. He's not called a Levite, so he was just an Ephraimite, Ephraimite. And um, he was a foreigner to Gibeah, but not a foreigner uh, in Ephraim. He said he was a Jew. The men of the place were Benjaminites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going? And where do you come from? And he said to him, we are passing from Bethlehem in Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah and I'm going to the house of the Lord. Now the house of the Lord at this time, we're told a little later in this story was in Bethel and um, the tabernacle uh, would be moved from place to place for, for a long time was in Shiloh and uh, if I can go back up to this map maybe we can even see it uh, on the map um, oops sorry uh, there's Bethel okay and Shiloh is up here in Ephraim and so apparently um, he is saying I want to go back to work <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a Levite and so I've got to be going to uh, the house of the Lord, but no one has taken me into his house. So that's kind of a offer to uh, invite the stranger to welcome them into his house. And verse 19, we have straw and feed for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and your female servant and the young man with your servants. There is no lack of anything. I, I will not be a burden to you. Uh, all we need is a place to sleep. Okay, I've got all the food for my animals. I've got food for me and for all the people who are traveling with me. But the old man practices real hospitality. And this was, uh, as I say, uh, the, the king virtue that people admired. We have a friend who is a Palestinian. And when he hosts us, when we go to Israel, uh, and I offer to pay for if we go out to eat or if, if uh, I offer to buy a bottle of wine or something, he says, no. The rule in Palestinian households is we give you hospitality A to Z. You know? And so it's an insult for me to want to pay for it. Uh, I'm not accepting his wonderful offer. So um, I think that is an old ancient uh, feeling that has oozed down through the centuries into people. And the old man replies in verse 20, Peace be to you. I will care for all of your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So as generous as you have been, traveler, 
Mr. Levite, I will still be a good host for you. So he brought him into his house and gave the donkeys feed. So even though the Levites said, we got food for our donkeys, he says, no, no, I insist on hospitality. I'm going to feed your donkeys, keep your food for your donkeys another time. And they washed their feet, which is good hospitality, and ate and they drank. So as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, literally Bene Belial, uh, sons of Belial, sons of the devil. Um, the word Belial can also be translated worthlessness, okay? That's how they are identified here. They surround the house when they hear that there's a guest and they start beating on the door. And this is a, a very uh, a strenuous beating. This is not just a, a knock, knock, knock. This, this is the kind of beating that hurts people, okay? Uh, it's used elsewhere in the Hebrew scriptures to mean that. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And if you're familiar with Genesis and the other stories, when a man knows his wife, that means he has sex with her. And so they want to have sex with the man, not with the women, that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Now, this is really parallel to what Genesis tells us happened in Sodom. And there's a number of parallels between those two uh, events that I'm going to share with you in just a second uh, that a, a scholar has identified. But what now he does is absolutely uh, mind-boggling for me as a modern um, Christian. Behold, here are my virgin, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now, violate them, do with them what seems good to you, but against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. So for them to abuse his male guest was. A, a vile thing, but he can offer his daughter and his virgin daughter and the concubine and let them abuse them all they want. <sighs> I mean, that, that's so jarring to our 21st century uh, sensibilities, isn't it? I mean, it, this shows you the utter depravity of everybody, even the good guys. I mean, this guy was hospitable. This guy had rescued them from the town square, but uh, now he's, he's despicable. You know? Now, before we get too high and mighty, um, and we got to remember uh, what the scriptures teach us is that there is no one good, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So as gloriously good our good deeds can be and as kind as we can be and compassionate as we can be we face the same tension that these people display and that is that we need to get on our knees every night and say god forgive me for what i have done wrong today and um thank you for jesus thank you for his forgiveness so the depravity of Israel is really stark. And Dr. Sarah Milstein summarizes the similarities between the Gibeah story and the Sodom story, which was already recorded in scripture before this episode happened. Both angels in Genesis 19 that are coming to visit Lot and the couple in Judges 19 arrive at night. In both texts, only someone who is an outsider takes them in. Lot does not belong to Sodom. He's just moved into town. He's watching the two angels. And this guy who is from Ephraim is also an outsider. The men of each town utter nearly identical demands regarding the male guests. Let us have them or him and we will know him. We will sodomize him. Now, sodomy, uh, forcing sex upon uh, another person, the male, uh, was something that many of the armies did as a way of humiliating the conquered. And so there was a lot of that, we've been told, in military history. So this is more common than uh, might appear um, once you start understanding what was going on in some of these ancient cultures. In both texts, the hosts tell the men not to commit such a wrong thing. They use exactly the same Hebrew word, al-tareu, 
uh, do not do this horrible thing. Both men offer two women up to the mob instead of the man. And so men's protection is more to be championed than a woman's protection. Now, I think in our modern culture, and I may be way off the base and you can correct me on this if, if I'm wrong. If I saw a woman being abused, I'm, I'm not as fit as I used to be, but I would do something to protect her. Uh, and I think most guys would, you know, uh, even if they didn't think they could go in and two guys are picking on a woman and, and slapping her around and so on, um, they would either call 911 or they would get some other guys and go over and jump in and say, we got to defend this lady. There's no way you can treat her that way. Um, this is mind boggling to our modern sensitivities that they would, that he would offer his own daughter for that kind of abuse and knowing that they were going to abuse her and that they were going to mistreat her. Now, let me stop there and see if you have any thoughts or questions at this point or any problems with what's being reported here. I mean, it's jarring, isn't it? I mean, you, you can't show the depravity of Israelites more graphically than this. And I think that's why the Lord has put it here in the text so that we understand why there needs to be a God of grace because these Israelites have not earned the right to be with a holy God. They have been despicable. And they knew her and abused her all night. Question? Our cities right now around the country, we have a new depravity. I mean, it might not be this exact same thing, but there's certainly not a concern for life. There's um, people that don't stand up for others, and maybe because they're afraid to stand up. I don't know. I mean, there's this isn't too far gone. I agree. Um, uh, what we're seeing here is also reflected in our culture. And so every generation has experienced this in one way or another. Um, and what this is doing is reminding us of the things we see. And so um, what choice did the man have? Okay. If, if, he had, if he had not offered his daughter and offered the concubine, what would happen to him? Probably. Probably got killed, beat up terribly. And so would the guy. But he at least had his integrity intact. He'd at least have gone down swinging. <laughs> at least he would have done uh, the noble thing. Yeah. But to offer her and uh, the concubine. And so now you expect the Levite will have a solution because he's a holy man. He's a functionary in the, in the tabernacle. And we're told, but the men would not listen to him. So the man seized, the man, the, the Levite, seized his concubine and made her go out to them. Here, take her. He saved his own skin by sacrificing her. I, uh, and they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as the morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. Do you think they're sleeping that night? Probably. I don't think the guy gives a rip. I don't think he cares. And furthermore, as her master rose up in the morning and when he opened the door of the house and went out to go on his way, Where's the curiosity about what happened to his concubine? Behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. I mean, this is a graphic picture of reaching out for rescue, reaching out to get home or to safety. And he said to her, get up, let us be going. Not, how are you? What happened to you? Well, obviously he knew and he just didn't care. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and man rose up and went away to his home. So the question is, was she a dead? Did she finally die at the door? 
Was she still alive when he put her on the donkey and took her home? By the time he gets home, he's going to cut her into pieces and send her throughout the 12 tribes of Israel calling for retribution against Benjamin and the Gibeites. Um, and so it, it just raises a lot of disturbing questions, doesn't it? And when he entered his house, he took a knife and taking hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb into 12 pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. That is so gruesome, it's hard to read. I'm sorry. Is there any biblical precedent for this action in Israel's history? Answer, no. We don't have another example of someone doing this to a human body and sending it to all the tribes of Israel or some of it to get them to, to uh, rally the troops to right the situation. And they were told, well, we are told after this that um, Saul in Gibeah takes an old yoke of oxen, cuts them in pieces and sends them throughout the territory of Israel, summoning all of Israel to go to war against the Ammonites. And he threatens, whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Okay, so, but that's not a parallel to this. And it's not before this. This is the first time that we have any record of this being done in Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it and take counsel and speak. What is it that they had never seen? The text isn't really specific, and it leaves a little ambiguity here. Is it that they had never seen an Israelite woman abused by a fellow Israelite? Or was it that they had never seen an Israelite who had cut up a dead body and send it all through Israel? Uh, the text leaves that open, and it heightens the depravity that is being here described. And so they meet together at Mizpah, and uh, they all respond. And 400,000 of the Israelites uh, gather at Mizpah, and that's right next door to Gibeah, where uh, they're going to do war against the Gibeahites. Uh, and they appeal to them, uh, to the Benjaminites, in whose territory Gibeah is located, and they give us those guys, and the Benjaminites say, no, no, no. And they get ready for war. And we're told that they end up having 26,000 versus the Israelites, 400,000. So uh, the first two days of the battle, uh, they kill off 40,000 of Israel's troops. And it looks like it's going pretty good for them. And the people mourn and they go to God at the tabernacle that's in Bethel. And they pray and say, "What can we go a third day? And God somehow communicates through the high priest's Urim and Thum, uh, yeah, go, because I will give them into your hands. And sure enough, they defeat the Benjaminites, and they slaughter them, and they kill all their women and all of their children, and only 600 Benjaminite men survive. And now they're struck with compassion. And they say, wait, we're about to decimate a whole tribe of Israel. We can't do that. But we promised that when we got together in Mizpah, None of us would give our daughters to the Benjaminites ever again in history. So where do we find them wives so that these 600 surviving men can have children and keep the tribe of Benjamin alive? So they go and they conquer Jabesh Gilead and they kill everybody in Jabesh Gilead and take the virgin daughters that they find, 400 of them, and they give them to the 600 soldiers. Now they're still short 200. So then they say, okay, we, got, we can't give daughters to anybody, and the people living in Shiloh can't because they're part of the tribe of Ephraim. But what we'll do is this. We'll say to the people of Shiloh, hey, send your guys out to snatch the women from Shiloh because they have a yearly dancing festival and take the virgin women and abduct them and make them your wives. And that's how you can get 200. Because 
if anybody protests, we'll say, well, they didn't give them to these women. These women were abducted. So they'll have technically fulfilled the law. Do you see how corrupt they all are? They're justifying everything. I mean, it's just unbelievably depraved. Well, that's the story. And I think the, uh, the message for me is, is overwhelming, you know, that this really shows how bad off Israel has gotten and how much they need to return to God. And Samuel will be the last judge who will be raised up as a prophet now, and he will summon Israel back to the Lord and to his word. So let me stop there for today and see if you have any concluding questions or thoughts. Is the gospel implied in these catalog of depraved reports? Is there a message to the reader of this story? Hey, before you get on your high horse morally and outraged at all this stuff here, make sure you remember that anytime you point your finger at somebody else, there's three fingers pointing back at you. And use this as an opportunity for you to repent and to look at yourself and to appreciate that God in the midst of all this stuff is still a God of grace when he allows his people to still exist, even though they don't deserve it. That's one message. You can think about that. And we'll start next week's class by seeing if you have any other thoughts that occur to you during the week. Okay. Shall we close with prayer? Lord, thank you for this opportunity to dig into this very gruesome story and uh, help it humble us so that we see that we too are sinners. We may not have done some of the things that are reported in this text, but we know that there are other ways that we can sin and violate your law and demonstrate that we need your grace as much as anyone. So please draw us close to your loving heart and to the grace of Jesus. And then help us to defend those who are being attacked, defend those who are weak and vulnerable, and to do what we can to stand up and be counted and to speak up. We ask for these blessings on us so we can be a blessing in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.